Welcome, gentle students, gentle readers of the novel Dream of the Red Chamber, Hong Rong, or Shi Tou Ji, a story of the stone as it's otherwise translated. Today, I will be treading into somewhat perilous ground uh, because I will be attempting to say something about history and something about literature, both of which are hotly and co consistently debated terms, certainly their fields. My own studies were in uh, East Asian uh, languages and literature and also in the field of history where I studied the history of China and Asia and in some sense the world, even art history. And so in the fields that we usually uh, define as literature and history, there is a great deal of debate. And this series of lectures is about a novel. And I am a professor of history. And to teach a course on, the, on a novel is a curious, is a curious um, practice from the point of view of some. And, uh, but but this, is, this is not uncommon. I took courses on Chinese, uh, the Chinese novel Dream of the Red Chamber, both in the history program as a graduate student and in the literature program as a graduate student. So uh, both history and literature at my uh, institution where I studied were both offered, uh, they both offered courses on the Dream of the Chamber novel by Cao Xueqin. But I'd like today, uh, by way of just uh, uh, maybe exploring a little bit about why I think a history program should provide courses in, in good literature, and indeed why I, I think literature programs should ask uh, its students to participate in or, or to take history courses. Um, sometimes I think there is a very ambiguous line between uh, history and, and literature. Certainly someone who uh, I've found very influential in my own reading life is Hayden White, who has essentially argued that the craft of history is in fact the, the craft of writing literature. So in any case, uh, these are debates that, uh, that uh, are often, uh, often indulged in the academy. So I'd like to then begin with what is literature. Uh, this is something that I'm not going to try and answer, but I'm going to offer some uh, thoughts about, right? Uh, some, in the, in the debate uh, about what literature is, one sees that there are very large differences uh, about how that question is analyzed, is considered in what we might call Western literature courses and in what we might call literature courses in East Asia. I myself have spent most of my time reading East Asian uh, works, well, specifically Chinese. And so the way literature is considered in China is quite a bit different than the way it is considered in what we might think of as a typical English department. So um, I think that um, in the United States, so I think that I should preface what I'm, what I'm about to say with, with the, what seems already a bit protracted, this is a, a problematic question and uh, uh, people who study Chinese history and Chinese literature are going to ask the question of what is literature in a different way than we might find in, for example, a, a course uh, in, in English. But the question that uh, well, one might ask in the, in the sort of Chinese context is, is, is literature anything printed? Uh, some people suggest that if it's printed, it's, it's literature. Is an almanac literature? Is uh, a cookbook literature? Is a newspaper literature? Is something that we scribble on a napkin over lunch literature? Uh, and most, I think, at least in the Chinese context, uh, most argue that none of these can be called literature from the Chinese point of view because they do not have lasting value. And then that begs the question, what is lasting value? Certainly as a historian, newspapers have tremendous value uh, uh, because they are the sources from which we draw a, a, a kind of diurnal record of events to recast history. But, but if, if literature is that which has um, permanent value, then so does a, a cookbook. A cookbook would qualify because a cookbook has permanent value. Um, 
So it's a problematic statement, but certainly uh, this ideal of permanent value is something that we will find uh, as, a, as one way to define literature in the Chinese context. Um, we can say that literature is something written that somehow seems true to us. Uh, it contains permanent value because there is something that, see, that resonates with us as true from the Chinese point of view. So we can say then from the Chinese point of view, at least the classical Chinese point of view, that, that what is literary is, is something that refuses to die. Um, it, it refuses to go away. Homer, one, one who reads Homer, if she or he is not moved by the opening of the Iliad, by... Uh, the long suffering of Penelope in the Odyssey. Uh, if one is not moved by these things, uh, I don't know. Uh, I, I don't know what else to uh, to do with that with that person, other than uh, perhaps just hope that they reread it and, and 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 these great these great literary works. But they refuse to die because even us who read millennia later the the account uh, in the Iliad, the accounts in the Iliad. We are moved by them, right? Th these accounts refuse to die because they move us, because they speak to us. They seem true, and, and not a, a, and not the sort of, and not the, the analytic way this happened on this date, but in the the, the deeply human uh, way, wherein we resonate with it as something true to us. So, but then again, isn't defining literature then a lot a lot? like uh, 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 settling on a firm definition of things like beauty, uh, imagination, poetry, or even settling on, on a, a firm definition of something like the word idealism. Uh, these, are, these are problematic. But let me just then offer some thoughts about literature uh, as a historian that, that I think will be helpful to the way I will be approaching it in these uh, lecture series. Uh, at least in part, I view literature as uh, C.T. Winchester does in his book. It's a sort of an old classic that few people, I think, even look at anymore. But there's a book called Some Principles of Literary Criticism by D.T. Winchester. And, and here is, here is a, I think it's on page 42. It says, there's, there's this question. It is the power to appeal to the emotions. Uh, this isn't a question, this is a statement. It is the power to appeal to the emotions that gives a book permanent interest and consequently is, has literary quality. Right? So it's literary if it appeals to the emotions. 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 But what about reason? Uh, one thing that makes something literature is precisely that, that it denies definition, right? Uh, it denies an appeal to reason in a way. Literature is literature because we say it is. Uh, we love it because it is true, because it moves us. Um, in a way, in the Chinese context, in the courses that I've taken, people have sort of settled on this statement, science be damned. Uh, because if, if literature has to be studied as as something that is dissected as a mere thing, like dissecting a worm in one's biology class, um, well then 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 uh, then it's really it doesn't really move us. So uh, literature reigns because it defies the well. Some and I don't mean to be too pejorative here, but but it was once said to me that literature reigns because it refuses science's arrogant comfort. Wow, that's a, a bit of a an attack on the sciences, and, and, and I certainly don't intend that. But, but, but this comfort in the knowability of things, literature essentially denies that, right? Um, not that I, I don't, uh, you know, I, I, I'm very much in some ways a Thomist, right? So I like the, the reliability of knowing things. But then again, I'm, I'm someone who loves literature, so then again, I don't like the, 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 the comfort of knowing things. But isn't there even more to literature than its ability to appeal to emotion uh, and to defy scientific definition? Isn't there something more than that that we can that we can latch on to? Winchester also says this: 
uh, he says that the true historian, here's, here's, some, here's a book on literary criticism conjuring the work of the historian. He says that the true historian knows that a great series of human actions can never be adequately comprehended by the intellectual faculties alone. The historian must set in motion the sympathies. Ah, now here, here is an argument in favor for everyone who teaches history to assign literature, and to assign novels and poetry and the like. That is, if we do not feel what past humans felt, we will never understand the past because we will never understand its people. Now, I, I, I would, I, I, I'm, I'm mentioning this because as, uh, as you, as I, continue to read the novel Dream of the Red Chamber, what makes it truly great mm -hmm. is that it's set in the 18th century in the Qing Dynasty in China, but we can connect with the emotions we can connect uh, with this. We can sympathize with what happens in the narrative, and and that uh, helps us to understand that period. We can feel in the way that Cao Xueqin, that Jia Baoyu, that Lin Daiyu, that in the way that they're feeling Xue Bao Chan. That is, uh, if we do not feel what, uh, if we do not feel what people in the past, we don't understand the past, right? So this is what literature does. And that, this is what literature does, that, that kind of acrid, um, analytic history can never do. It makes us feel, it makes us sympathize, and therefore it makes us understand. Uh, I love uh, something that Jonathan Spence once said. He's a, a Chinese a historian of Chinese past. And he, he suggested that historians pull stones out of water and somehow they lose their beauty. That is, you know, stones underwater have a, a kind of beauty, and we historians tend to pull them out, and they lose their beauty. Well, I would say that what makes the past beautiful, in large part, is how it's cast into a literary framework. Um, and if you do, you know, if we do study the stones, and we have to pull them out of the water, um, I think the, the, the job of the historian is to at least put the stones back in the water uh, at times, so that our students, and so that ourselves, can uh, can see them again in the context of this this beautiful uh, sympathetic uh, 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 context. Um, and I would say if you if you read uh, uh, Jonathan Spence's *The Death of Woman Wong*, uh, this is a good example of the craft of the historian re uh, uh, reinvigorating the past in a way that we can sympathize with it. So again, let me just go back to China here. There's no. Chinese word for literature that, that is a Western term and um, the the term that will be used to translate the English term the, the term literature is a wenxue. and actually the word wenxue, uh is the combination of those two terms uh, is is actually Japanese and as much as there are two Chinese characters kanji that went to Japan Japan is uh, translating Western works um, really uh, after during the Meiji Restoration uh, largely uh, uh, and uh, the Meiji era and so Japan will put together two terms one xue, xue means to study and one one uh, is a very important Chinese word I mean uh, one means uh, pattern it has a pattern if you've ever read any classical Chinese literature like the Zuo Zhuan uh, uh, one notices patterning embedded within the text. A certain number of uh, uh, characters will be strung together. Uh, actually, David Scoberg has written a, a really fine, uh, a fine book about uh, the Zuo Zhuan and this this use of patterning. Right. So, literature is something that is patterned. It also means refined. So it is refined. It is elevated. Um, and you, we often, anyone who reads a lot can tell a, a great difference between uh, something like uh, a, a Harlequin uh, romance and, and the Iliad. There's something greatly tangibly different in 
uh, how those two works uh, can be compared to each other. So literature is something that is patterned. Now, uh, in China, the ultimate expression of truth, emotion, and ultimately history is, well, poetry. Um, in the uh, Shu Jing, in the canon of uh, Shun, uh, we see this statement. Shi yan zhi ge yong yan. It means something like poetry articulates the will, the intention, and song makes what is articulated long-lasting. Um, in essence, um, the Chinese were, were making the same claim that Aristotle made in, in his, his uh, essay on, on, on literature, on poetry, on poetics. Um, history, he said, history reveals the details, but poetry, or literature, reveals the universal. Poetry makes words lasting, right? It, it makes them uh, more eternal, right? It is this universal aspect of, of literature that makes it so damn hard to define, right? Which is why we shall, uh, in, in these lecture series, uh, we shall really um, set aside an attempt at accepting uh, that what makes a particular written document moving, like we would sort of set aside this, this idea that we have to define it in a way. Um, uh, uh, we'll set aside uh, uh, the attempt to define while accepting that, that what makes a particular written document moving and true, whatever that means, is what makes it literature. If it's moving and true in a way, I think that's what makes it literature. So late imperial uh, literature in China is a complicated thing because you have multiple genres, as you do in, 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 other, uh, in other cultural contexts. But the, the, the genre that we'll be reading is a novel. And to define something as a novel in the Western context is, is also problematic. Um, we, in the Chinese context, we know that the, the, the word for novel, xiao shuo, means something, uh, means small talk, small words. It's a pejorative term. Um, I'll probably mention this in, in subsequent lectures if, if, I, if I recall, because it's an important point to make, right? That is, the novel uh, is something that was largely generated in the context of a Confucian class of literati who uh, demeaned that genre as insignificant, small talk. Thus, the word, the word for novel in Chinese is xiao shuo, small talk. It is not exalted. It is not exalted in the, in the Confucian classics. And, and the, the, the Confucians, uh, who, uh, who are essentially uh, uh, pejoratively describing Xiao Shuo, the novel, are the people who are writing it, and they are the consumers of that form of literature. Now, I want to just end this, this very brief uh, uh, discussion of thinking about literature and history, literature vis-a-vis -vis history, history vis-a-vis -vis literature, I want to end with an example of how patterning works, not only in the actual words, but with, in, in Chinese literature, but in the concepts that are expressed. And, and we, cannot get, we cannot avoid acknowledging the significance of polarity. Some people use the word binary. I think binaries is, is an okay term, but, but I think polarity is a, is a better term to describe this. And not just polarity, but polarity that isn't actually a duality. Uh, duality almost implies a, a sense of conflict of two polar, not even opposites, but two polar halves. And um, this notion of polarity in, in Chinese literature is, is significant. And I want to say something about uh, polarity at, in terms of its notion of yin and yang. Uh, yin and yang being the sort of classical uh, uh, polar halves of, of, of yang, which would be sort of masculine, yin, feminine, yang, day, yin, night, yang, fire, yin, water, yang, life, yin, death. I have said that already. Um, I wouldn't say bad or good because uh, those are categories that are complicated in China. Bad or good is probably more, more related to if something is harmonious or disharmonious, uh, har harmony being good and disharmonious being bad. Now, um, but there are four basic principles of yin and yang 
of these two polar halves that I think are significant uh, to understanding Chinese literature and especially the novel Dream of the Red Chamber. So if, if you uh, undertake to read this novel, do re remember that this notion of polarity is one that uh, should always be in, in as, function as background music as you read the, the narrative. There are four basic rules of yin and yang, and these four basic rules are echoed, are represented within the narrative of the novel. Yin and yang, uh, uh, they all ha they have opposites, right? So essentially, the first rule of yin and yang is there is such a thing as yin and yang. There are opposites. There is day and night. There, there is uh, life and death. There is masculine and feminine. There are polarities, and these polarities in the perfect context are not at conflict with one another, but they are in harmony with one another, right? So the first rule of yin and yang is that there are opposites in a way. And then the second rule is that they create each other. Yin creates yang, yang creates yin. That is, by defining something as one thing, the mere act of defining it engenders its, its polar um, opposite. It's a problematic term, but we have to have some utility here with, with terms to make sense. So when you say something is masculine, then in a way you acknowledge and engender the feminine. Something is light and something is dark. Something is fire and something is water. A mountain is yang and, and, and water is yin. And then the third rule is that they become each other. That is, night becomes day and day becomes night. Life becomes death. Death, you know, the, the, the whole idea of the... The, the organic body uh, uh, essentially decomposes and fertilizes and, and, and engenders life, right? So there is this notion that yin becomes yang and yang becomes yin. And then finally, the fourth one is that yin and yang contain each other. There is nothing perfectly yang or nothing perfectly yin in this paradigm. Um, this was a, a great intellectual debate uh, between uh, native Chinese thinkers and missionaries during the late Ming Dynasty and Qing Dynasty, and that is this notion that there is a perfectly good God. That, um, that is a concept that in China is a problematic one uh, because of this notion that nothing is perfectly yin or perfectly yang. Right? Uh, in the middle of the day, you will have shadows. In the middle of the night, you will have the reflex reflections from the moon. Uh, so the, the, those four rules, again, yin and yang are opposites, yin and yang create each other, yin and yang become each other, and yin and yang uh, uh, contain one another. And then finally, uh, just to end, I want to mention the, the, the very famous symbol called the Taiji, the grand ultimate symbol, which is this, this symbol that people call the yin and yang symbol. And the Taiji was really formulated by uh, someone by the name of Zhou Zhuni. And, and the, the symbol represents a kind of notion. It's not a, 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 a Thomistic ex nihilo nihil feet, that nothing comes from nothing. It's not really that. Because um, there is a no, there is, we either have to have um, a, a prime mover, something comes from something uh, that was not itself created by something else. That is the Thomistic point of view, right? Uh, ex nihilo nihil feet, nothing comes from nothing. So everything came from something that was not itself created. Now, uh, the, the, the East Asian uh, understanding of, the, 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 of reality, of, of cosmology, is such that it accepts what we might think of as an eternal regression. There's always been something, or there's always been nothing. There's no such thing as pure nothing, or there's no such thing as a prime mover. Eternal regression is fine. It goes back forever. Uh, eternity is not, I mean, et eternal regression, that is the, the idea of no creation, um, uh, is uh, uh, cre uh, 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 creation from nothing is, is uh, well, that, that's, not a, a that's not a Chinese idea that's, that's really entertained. Now, um, uh, so classically, so I'm looking at the, the symbol here. Zhou Duni had, had this idea that there was a kind of nothingness, right? If we think about a, to make a schema of reality, there was a kind of nothingness that, that from it, from this void, uh, was engendered polarity. And the polarity consists of yang and yin. And once this polarity is, is uh, extant, then, then yin and yang, by coexisting, coexist 
together and then they are represented in, in, in a way wherein you see yin and yang uh, 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 coextant uh, together. And, and since yin and yang cannot exist in a stasis, right? Everything is in movement. Uh, the yin and yang symbol that we think of with this curve, that represents the movement of yin and yang. So it's, it's as if some, one person has said to me, it's as if you put two colors of paint on a plate with a line and you spin the plate and it would sort of imagine that it makes this yin and yang symbol. So in movement, that is yin will become yang. Day becomes night, night becomes day. In this cyclical notion, this, uh, uh, this cyclical contained cosmological system that is the, the system of yin and yang of polarity. Well, uh, I think that is a very good place to end this very brief discussion of, of literature and how literature is expressed and structured from this point of view of yin and yang. Xiao Shuo, petty talk, small talk, is actually anything but petty, anything but small. It's uh, intensely complicated and beautifully, beautifully structured. Well, with that, uh, I wish you all a very good health. Juni Mashanti Jen Kang. And uh, if you want to know what happens in the next uh, lecture, stay tuned to the next post and Gambe.